Right, uh, Thomas, I'm going to begin by asking if, if you'd read the novel uh, before sort of getting involved in it and if it was always a story that you wanted to kind of adapt and bring to the big screen. I did not know much about Thomas Hardy. He's not on our curriculum in Denmark. I hadn't, I hadn't read the book. I read the script. It was sent from my agent. It was all very sort of classic in that sense. And I fell in love instantly. Then I read the book and fell even deeper in love. I, it humbled me, uh, and I decided to make a Thomas Hardy movie and not a Thomas Vinterberg movie. Uh, that was sort of my my mantra to begin with, and I um, decided to try to make a tr try to keep the richness of the characters all the way through the filtering. There's a lot of filtering, obviously. That's the main challenge of making adaptations. Uh, there's so much you can't do. There's so much you can't bring to the screen so many pages to be condensed into two hours. Um, yeah, so that's that's the starting point. Do you think in some ways it helped that you hadn't read it previously because it almost came, meant you came into this very fresh and were able, you, you were quite detached from it kind of originally? Yes, that helped me. I started to watch this Schlesinger movie and stopped because I wanted to stay naive, so to speak. And everybody, every time people started to talk about the cultural inheritance of this and the, the weight and the why to remake it, I sort of tried to ignore it, ignore it and come back to the, the love at first sight feel that I had when I read the script. I was wondering, I mean, because for somebody who's made such kind of avant-garde sort of uh, movies which really kind of push the boundaries of cinema, this very affectionately kind of revels in sort of traditionalism. And I was wondering, does that make it any easier though to make well I guess the story of me and what I've done before is the first thing I sort of put behind me I I I devote to the work and the nature of the work and each work has its own nature I guess uh, I did dogma 20 years ago and dogma was a, was an attempt to sort of make that's festin Right, I was an attempt to make it as naked as possible, uh, and I guess I'm still doing that. Uh, my way of approaching these frocks and bonnets was to try to get past them and get into the characters and find the rich inner life of them. So when you're when you're making movies now, do you still find that you're using kind of techniques or, or certain um, sensibilities that you 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 were kind of using in the dogma the sort of movement? Do you reckon? Absolutely, I'm working in the same way. The thing about dogma is that because it was such a big success, it became fashion overnight. You could get dogma furniture in my own country. So then it's over, then it's not naked anymore, then it's a fashionable dress. And it, I guess that's, that dress is now even old. Yeah. So, so we're, we're beyond that. I'm in a, in a different place now. And, and I have to find different ways of trying to, to undress these characters and, and the way of making film. I mean, of course, uh, Carrie Mulligan is absolutely remarkable in the lead. I was wondering what it was about her that you felt would be the, the perfect for, for this lead role. Well, other than being a fantastic actress, brilliant actress, very in, with very classy cho uh, choices behind her, uh, she has this beautiful combination of being very strong, uh, at moments, I guess, even controlling, and yet very vulnerable. Uh, and very fragile and lovable. So this this um, modern, pot, modern portrait of, of a woman sort of already lies within Carrie Mulligan as, as a person. And um, I, I, I see strong relations between Carrie and Bathsheba, I guess. Because I, I read that she said that she saw Rustin Bone and sort of called you up and said, oh, you've got to get Matthias in, into, this, into this movie. I was wondering if that was, if he was already someone that was on your radar if she had actually introduced him and the idea of him being this role? Uh, she might be right. Uh, I, I don't remember, but I'm sure she's right about that. He was on all our, everybody's mind at that point because Rust and Bone was something different. See, Matthias Schoenatz has sort of reintroduced the male lead that is both sensible, vulnerable, and yet still very much a man. He's a huge man. And, and the character of Oak, I think, um, does have to f find a combination of, of embracing a woman, uh, giving space to a woman, and yet still very much be a man. And, and even by the choice of him, that was done. 
And uh, of course, next up, you've, uh, you're collaborating with Tobias Lindholm again with the Commune. I was just wondering what that one's all about and sort of, has it sort of started shooting yet? We've shot it. Oh. I've almost edited it. And it's become a, a, a film very dear to me. It's much more Thomas Vinterberg movie, than, whereas this is much more Thomas Hardy movie. <laughs> Uh, it's about s slightly about my upbringing in a, in a commune, a house full of half-naked academics in the seventies, <laughs> and uh, which I very much enjoyed, by the way. <laughs> Brilliant! We're well, to see it. Thank you so much for your time today. Much Thank, you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching. Hey, you guys! Hey, you guys! Huh? Hey, you guys! Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey. hey.